Okay, so this is the SNARS monthly meeting, and this is the Q&A section after the presentation that Chuck Abrams gave about coax. Before we get started, um, one question that people asked was, um, can we get the slides? I don't know if we really need them, and the reason why I, I say is because we have the recording, um, which gives you all the information. Um, so um, if somebody wants the slides, just go, go directly to Chuck. Um, Best way you can reach him, Chuck at ABR. What is it? IND. Yes. Yeah. At ABRIND.com. So there's also uh, the the data sheets as well as product pages are up there as well, where a lot of this information is on the web the website also. Great. Thanks. And the recording will be up in a few days up on uh, the SNARS um, YouTube channel. And the way you find that is you go to the SNARS.org website, scroll all the way to the bottom, and the second to the last line says so Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society, and it says watch video, and that's the um, YouTube channel. Okay, so let's start with, uh, a lot of people said very informative, thank you. Let's start with some Q&A. So let me set this up. Um, if you have a question for Chuck, just open your mic and give your call sign, and then I can acknowledge you in case we have a double or a triple. Who's got a question for Chuck? Uh, open your mic and give your call, please. While he's doing that, I have a couple of questions. Um, just to Looks like Howie's trying to get in. Where? I'm not seeing it. Uh, it looks like he's Howie? muted. He raised his hand and started talking, but he didn't turn his Howie, mic on. Howie, do you on. want to open your mic? Howie, you're not. Go ahead and unmute yourself. There it is. Okay. There you go. Uh, the question yeah. I had, Chuck, was, was uh, let's talk about the uh, uh, the fastening of the connectors to the coax, which is an important consideration, I think. Uh, so typically, um, the best practice that we follow is we'll solder the center connector and then we crimp the braid. Um, soldering the center conductor obviously helps that connection and then crimping the braid allows a 360 degree connection to the shield as well as helping against the uh, issues regarding pull. So that's the process that we typically use. Um, I know some people have been used to using the soldering with the Wii poles, but even with my best solderer that we have, um, the, kind of, the connection is only usually about 180 degrees, 120 degrees of the braid gets connected to the body of the connector. So that is the reason why we kind of shifted away from doing it that way. Um, I will also recommend soldering the center pins or having a solder center pin design because a captive center pin will move and shift over time where it can uh, change the capacitance and then have some loss issues. So always still, like I said, recommending doing it that, that way. Thank you very much. Next question or N7 JDM here. Mm -hmm. Chuck, uh, can you talk about uh, sealing the uh, coax uh, uh, connection? You got any uh, tips about that? Sure thing. So a uh, couple different things that can be done there. Uh, one is if you're going to do it, you know, yourself or get something assembled, having sealed back ends, um, use a tubing that is an adhesive lined tubing. It will have the um, adhesive bond when it connects through and uh, getting it as close to the back end of the connector as possible. Um, next step is when you're doing the mating, um, you can use a dielectric sealant such as like stuff or a dielectric grease to make that connection. And then an overall wrapping. Um, some people still use tape, which believe it or not is fine if you've used the dielectric sealant, but um, in a lot of cases using a mastic, I know there's coax seal, which can get messy, but there's other mastic products from like 3M and other places where they're designed once you've applied the mastic, it actually helps bond to itself a little bit and then um, can be easily removed and it just peels right off. 
And then the last piece is you can use, um, some people I wouldn't recommend using shrink tubing when you're mating the connectors, um, but you can use a cold shrink product. And the reason being is anything that has a high adhesive um, can be really hard to clean if you did need to get in there and uh, disconnect it and replace the line. So those are just some areas to look at. All right, thanks much. Very good. Uh, let's see, Alpha Fox uh, Six Alpha. I think you had a question, Michael. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. You mentioned about RF power um, would would be an issue. Is a hundred watts normally something one should worry about, or is it only when you start getting uh, much higher wattage that uh, the heat from RF comes into play? Uh, usually we look at that at about one kW and above. So for a barefoot hundred Watts, um, I wouldn't be too concerned with it. So Thank you. That's sorry, the short answer. <laughs> so, and how about the skinny, the skinny, uh, 16, uh, stuff is that what's the power rating on that? So the small awesome. stuff, the, the, the three sixteen, um, the power rating on that is about 200 Watts at HF and roughly about 100 at, at 400, 15, 500 megahertz. So still somewhat respectable. The bigger challenge for that smaller material is the connectors that are used. So those can still hit you know, the power that I just gave you, but anything above about 100 watts with the way the PL, it has to be done through an adapter. Um, you know, and then the BNC on there can handle it as well but it's more like I said, the connector design because it's so small and it's so close that um, I generally don't recommend, you know, doing more than about hundred Watts or about 50 Watts on the VHF UHF side of things. Pretty good. Um, let's see who else has a question. Just open your mic and give your call sign. We'll acknowledge you. W6XX Tom over here. I had a question for Chuck as far as testing of older coax. Is there a standard or, I mean, do you, can you measure test it, high pot, use a multimeter? How would you uh, tell if you're- Actually, those, those are all good places to start, to be honest with you. Um, so, cause we not only test with a TDR, but you can also test, we do high pot tests. So for example, all the cables that I wind up building, we run it through a high pot test, which, um, can be up to about 10 kV, 25 kV, depending on the cable itself um, in a, as a standard. Um, that's a good way to test because it's a quick breakdown test over a couple of milliseconds. You can certainly, you know, I hate to say it, just simply using an ohm meter and checking real quick just to verify something. Um, having an SWR meter in conjunction, whether it's on the radio or something else um, and, and checking that because one of the best ways to tell a dielectric goes is the old rule of thumb was checking the SWR and you could start seeing it increasing consistently then you knew the cable was starting to go. Um, so those, those are probably all good places to start. You covered probably a lot of ground by your question, um, but you know, any one of those tests, anything to kind of start to put suspicion to practical terms, makes sense and it never hurts to do the testing that you just mentioned those different things so thanks sorry okay uh who else has a question or mike can give you a call i have one more yeah hi how are you go ahead yeah uh chuck um the the various attenolizers that are on the market uh uh, advertise that they can they can check coaxial cables. Just out of curiosity, how accurate is that? Is that is that a good test to run? Um, so the the part is part about some of the antenna, like the real basic analyzers that you see for like fifty sixty dollars. Um, the hardest thing is looking in the spec and trying to see where the noise floor is. Some of them set the noise floor at like forty dB. You'd probably want an analyzer that does a little bit better than that. That gets closer to the um, usually about 70, 80 dB or even better. Because, um, like, for example, the analyzer that I use 
it, the plant, it goes down to minus 160. And the reason being is the better the noise floor is set with the analyzer and setting those basic test results, the better you're going to get a test um, and see how well the cable is performing and how accurate it is. So any tool isn't a bad tool, but it just depends on like, um, I'm trying to think of the guys out of Europe that have those handheld analyzers. Um, I think their series starts with an AA. I'm drawing a blank on their name. Um, they seem to work well, and those work decent. Um, sometimes, I think I actually have one sitting here. We, we monkey with um, a couple of the guys play with, what is it, those little SAA analyzers that came out of China for the longest time. I don't know if you can see on the screen those little yeah, guys. I think the one you're thinking is the rig experts. That's the AA. Yeah. Rig expert does a nice job. Um, you know, these little handheld pieces, they're not they're not great, but they're not bad either for HF. I mean talking about the nano nano nano, nano VNAs. Right. Um, but they're the nano VNAs are very limited. Um, you know, so some people will open them up across a wide band and their results start to decrease in accuracy a little bit. And if you narrow them down to only a five megahertz sweep, they work okay, 10 maybe. Um, the antenna analyzers can do, you know, almost 100 to 250 meg sweeps. Um, like I said, some of the professional ones though can do a gig as far as the sweep goes. So it just depends on, I hate to say of what you can afford, because like I said, some test equipment is better than no test equipment at all. But um, the, like I said, those rig experts seem to be pretty popular and they seem to do a pretty good job. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Howie. Hey, go ahead, Clint. I was just kind of curious, uh, current uh, climate out there, how is ABR dealing with uh, product shortages and are you able to, to keep up with everything? Uh, fair question. So we build all the coax here in the U.S. Um, and we've got allocations here that we have, we have mills that we've invested in. Um, a couple of them, that's where part of the, this is more of a Mark question almost because he developed relationships about 30, 40 years ago. So we invested in a lot of tooling here in the States. Um, that being said, we can't find screw machines to make connectors really anymore. So we invested in a broker overseas, um, one that's actually handles some of the products in Taiwan. And then we have another guy that handles Europe from Germany and actually blew it out Japan. Um, so we've kind of sourced a number of different manufacturers and we fly in about a third of our product right now. We don't trust the boats at all. So um, for the most part, we're doing okay. Um, I don't, I don't know if John might have the hairs on the back of his neck cringe some days, but, uh, we still, uh, yeah, we do everything we can to keep that consistency coming in as far as the product flows and stuff like that. Um, I will tell everybody copper is miserable as far as the pricing goes. Uh, a few years ago, we do everything on copper weight, but we still do it now, but, um, you could do copper for two thirty a pound at last report. Copper was at, I think it was four fifty three. Yeah, that's what it was closing yesterday at. So, unfortunately, as everybody's seen costs go up, it's just like a bottle rocket right now. I think it's steady at that level, but it's hard on people. I I will tell you, I have used multiple uh, coaxes from your product line over the years. Uh, one of the things I've uh, enjoyed most is I could call you guys up, order a specific length with the specific connectors I wanted on the ends. You'd even customize the markers. Uh, it was a good product. It's been a good product. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I always appreciate the feedback and accolades and stuff. And, and that goes for good, bad, or indifferent too. If there's something else you'd like to see us do or see you know questions on it, we always do continuous improvement too. So 
We're not quite ISO yet, but we've got all the processes down. We just haven't done the expense of doing the actual formal ISO approval. So we're still waiting a little bit right now on that piece. Thanks, uh, Clint. Before we go to Wes, uh, somebody put in the chat, do you have an RG174 equivalent? So we do, that's the 100 series now, is what it's called. Um, I'll be honest, it costs me as much to make the 100 as it does for the 316. So I'd almost recommend just letting people know that buying the 316, um, even though, you know, yes, it's a silver product and yes, it's Teflon, um, because of the design and the size, um, it, it's because of the labor and the other <laughs> costs of the tooling um, that I would almost recommend people looking at 316 instead of the 100. We sell, we still sell both. Um, we still work with both, but it's just um, just a perspective right now. Okay, thanks, Wes. You got a open mic. You want to? Yes, I. Yeah, I just want to ask. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, who, uh, there's a couple people out there that, that make the products that you, that you have as well. I've looked at a couple of them, and uh, I keep coming back to uh, to ABR. Simple reason: it just it looks better. It seems like it performs better. It's set up better than what I've seen. And um, yeah, I, I've tried one uh, companies that got it out of uh, was it uh, amateur. Down there in Henderson, I can't think of what it's called. <laughs> Amateur Radio Supply, I think it is. And uh, the product that they had, uh, I thought it was inferior when I got it. It didn't only, only had about 25 feet of it. And I thought it was inferior compared to what yours with the ABR is. You know, and I use I use exclusively RG8X because it's just pliable. I mean, I, I, however, though, looking at some of your specs, I might be uh, changing up just to try some things. And, uh, but anyway, I just want to say you got a, you got a great product. I like what you're doing with it. And, uh, but I was just wondering, is, uh, is there any competition out there for you? Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, um, we, we have a lot of competition. I mean, um, you know, we get the stuff here stateside that we compete with. I mean, I'll be honest, you know, like I said, we've got a strong relationship with the mill and, you know, it's, it's really great. We don't own the mill. We own some tooling in there. We help pay for some people over there, but um, we still, you know, we're not a Belden, we're not a Comsco. We're still, you know, those guys. And to be honest with you, we still have great relationships with those companies though. Um, we still see them on a lot of occasions, whether it's best practices, tooling, um, especially on the harness side of things. We've always gotten together and talked through that. Um, we actually worked through with Amphenol many moons ago, almost when Mark got started again, for tapering the center pin, which everybody you know, doesn't seem like it's left that big of an issue, but it helped improve the stabilization of the impedance. So um, now, obviously, Amphenol is a good brand, and they've got their place and we do compete with them a little bit, but we've, we've always had some friendly relationships. Um, overseas, a little bit different story. <laughs> There's a lot of guys that take shortcuts. Um, we've gotten brokers, you know, the broker comes back and says he checked out a mill to try to do something or a plating facility and had to walk through a Chinese restaurant to get through there. Eh, they're off the list again. <laughs> so we move on. Um, but you know, the platers and the other guys, we go visit every so often. So, um, definitely, you know, the types of things that, like I said, it's a give and take. So it's kind of hard to question the answer. Sometimes I guess we have friendly competitors because we all have our place, but overseas it's any man for himself. <laughs> I, have, I can understand that. Thank you. Hey, another question came up on the chat. Um, what do you think of 3M70 uh, self-fusing silicone rubber tape to seal coax connectors? Yeah, that's one of the mastics that I was referring to. Um, uh, that product, um, and there's 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 a bunch of 3M products um, from a mastic side. Um, there's the 8200 series that I'd recommend. There's a couple different mastic sizes there. Uh, the self-sealing tape is good. Um, the hardest thing about the self-sealing tape is 
when you wrap it, it sometimes is thin and it's it breaks a little bit easier. Some of the stuff that uh, the other stuff that I recommended is a little bit thicker because it only takes one wrap and it can be hand molded into place. And then it just peels right off and cuts right off. Um, if anybody's interested, like I said, shoot me an email and I can send you a list because there's products that we just don't sell, but I would still re highly recommend because a number of commercial guys uh, that use it and it's not that expensive when you really think about it. Um, so, uh, and coax seal isn't horrible either. Um, the hard part about coax seal is it just gets really goopy. And if you're going to do that, I would recommend wrapping tape first and then putting the coax seal over it um, just because it gets into everything. You know, speaking of coax seal, uh, one of the hams in the club uh, turned me on to something interesting. It's called cork tape. It looks, looks very similar to coax seal. You buy it at, the hardware, at uh, the hardware store like Home Depot or whatever. It's in a much larger roll. Uh, it's much wider and like a ton of value. You get a lot of it. It's for wrapping um, pipes, and he gave me some, and it looks kind of really similar. Not not exactly, but really similar to uh, to coax seal. Have you ever seen that or used it? Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've heard of it. I, I really haven't used it, um, but I've heard of it. And um, I mean, we monkey with it a little bit just to see if it would interact with anything with the jacketing and now it worked out just fine. So, um, like I said, there's a lot of good manufacturers of different mastics out there. So, I mean, if you found something that you like, I would recommend other people testing it just because, um, you know, mastic can be very expensive as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see if anybody else has a question before I ask another one. Um, just open your mic if you have a question. Somebody else asked, what about 3M M-Flex 2155? That one I haven't played with. Yeah, yeah, I'm not too familiar with that one. Okay. Um, one thing I like to know about, and I don't think you covered if you did, I based out is, can you tell us a little bit about the manufacturing process of coax? How is it actually all the different components put together so when we buy it and we get this string or this roll, how, how, do, they, how do they actually build it? Um, the mill? So, uh, uh, essentially, the cable or the wire itself um, will come on a master reel, anywhere from about 50 to 100,000 feet of the center conductor will, will come into the plant. Um, and then it's all through a very straight line process. Um, so, but it's in stages. Um, so what it does is the first part is you just extrude the center conductor. Um, so the center goes through a standardized extruder and has the pl plasticizer or the, or the center, sorry, dielectric applied to it. Um, and it's applied at either through two stage or a single stage, depending on if it's a standard PVC, which is like 213 or PE, or it's a gas injected where it has a nitrogen fill into the line. Um, and then it goes through a long tray bath about, it's about 120 to 150 feet long where it cools it. So it's got the center conductor and the dielectric. So it looks like standard hookup wire for lack of a better term. And then from there, that material, when it runs through the end of the line, is generally run in lengths of anywhere from about 5,000 to 10,000 feet. Because at this point, we're going to make this product pretty heavy once we put the braiding and the outer dot or outer jacketing onto it. So uh, it goes through the, the reels and then gets cut through at about five to 10,000 feet. And then it goes through these braiders. Um, and I don't know if you caught it in the picture, but I can show you here real quick. Um, can, can I share my screen real quick if that's okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. All right. Uh, share my screen. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Um, so this shows the picture of, you know, like I said, just a dielectric melting off of the barrel wire and getting through the crosshead extruders. And there's actually a 360 degree crosshead that goes through. And it, after it gets extruded at the end there, it's a coated wire that just run through the end. 
And then from there, what it does is it goes into this other picture that you see, which is a standard braider. Um, it's almost like the same way as a Garmin braider. It's the same companies that actually make this and it weaves it right over the extruded dielectric that you kind of saw in the other picture so that it gets woven into place. Now, if we do a foil, there's a, there's a picture there that you don't see in this, which is the foil gets applied, applied first and then the dielectric gets put on, or sorry, the braid gets put on. Um, and then once that's all done and it's run through, um, it runs through a litany of tests at that point. So what they do is they check the distance between the two. There's a tester that does that. There's a tester that measures the dielectric's diameter, as well as a test then running the braid's conductivity. So there's a little bit of electrical testing that's done when it's woven. And then from that, if it all passes that, it goes into a final stage where it has its extrusion, once again, kind of the same extruder, but in this case, it's not the bare wire, it's the coax that runs through another larger extruder where it gets the jacketing material put onto it. And in that process, the jacket gets put in there and it goes through another water trough to cool it, but then it gets another test to make sure the diameter is correct. And then there's a laser marker that marks uh, what type of coax it's on there. So fortunately, I don't have those pictures in there. It's probably good for me to put that in this presentation, um, but that's kind of just a high level view of how that works. So yeah, really good. Um, let's see. Uh, Don has a question on chat. Uh, really interesting question for it for us hobbyists. Um, Chuck, do you recommend a crimp tool for installing connectors? Uh, he said he's he only soldered only soldered shielding through the weep holes in the past. So mm -hmm. that's a really good question, Don. Um, so. There are a number of crimp tools that are available um, that you can use. I here's here's my take on on this with the crimping tool. Um, one is you know just a standardized hand tool with an insert can get done. Um, I sell them. You know they're like thirty five dollars a piece. You don't have to get too fancy with the crimping tools. There's Jars, excuse me, the jaws that are either scissor type or the ones that are 90 or 180 degrees opposed are fine. Um, you can find them in different places as well. And you can find them to all the different cable types. So like the diameter of a 0.405, which is an RG8 or a 0.290, which is the 8X. Um, so those are all readily available as far as those tools. And somebody wants to send me a question, I can always give them a list of manufacturers that make the tools. What I use is a special press in my shop with a special die set that's created and it, it comes out of a company from Germany. And what that does is it's an equivalent of a two ton press and puts a lot of pressure behind the crimp and stuff to keep it into place between even hand crimping or using the press. The press, we usually use at a 200 pound pole just to make sure that it's not gonna come apart. Even if you hand crimp it, you could probably get a 50 to 60 pound pull test, but with soldering the pull test, they generally fall apart anywhere from about 15 to 25 pounds. So just to kind of give you an idea of why that's so important, that's, that's one of the major reasons is just it is, it is very difficult once you've crimped a connector into place to, to really get it ripped out. Okay, very good. Uh, we got time for some more questions. Who else has something? Just open your mic and ask away. Okay, while people are thinking of that, do you get on the air much at all? I know you're a busy guy with the, uh, with the business as a, as a ham. Get a little bit of drive time. Uh, been playing with a DMR due to one of my customers pushing me into it. <laughs> um, actually get a little bit more into HF. Uh, so it, it, there are times where it can jump on, spend some time. Um, my father is an FT8 nut lately. I, he just loves it from a GX, 
from the playing the geography game off of it. Um, so he's been doing more of that. And, you know, now that he's retired, he's probably got a lot more time than I do, but that's, those are all, those are all good, good modes. Uh, uh, you can work a lot of guys on FT without much power. And, um, also two things, uh, 10 meters for everybody. 10 meters was wide open yesterday. I worked with a bunch of guys on sideband down in the Caribbean and out to, um, the South Pacific and all around. That was nice. Also on DMR, we're very active in DMR up here in um, in the Reno Basin. Um, we have a uh, net uh, a tech net on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. our time. That's 10 p.m. yours in Central Time. That you're welcome to come on to if you like. And um, there's all sorts of stuff. So very good. That's great. Okay, Clint, maybe you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just uh, kind of questioning. I've got a couple of cables that I need to shorten up as I'm installing uh, into a new house that I moved into a few months ago. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, you've got some recommendations on connector manufacturers, connector sourcing to work best with your cables. Um, so we, we have a few partnerships um, that are private label and non-disclosure. We also work a lot with Amphenol. We work with uh, Huber Sooner. Um, we worked a little bit with RF Industries over the years and a few others. Uh, some of these companies are doing brokers or two steps, that's okay. Um, so we generally try to look at it more from what we've tested out of the product. Um, so for example, like the PLs that we're doing, we actually have a company that does the plating of the pins for us, but he ships pins out of Germany and that gets sent over to our guy in Taiwan who then insults, inserts them into the Teflon dielectric. And then it finally goes over to the milling house where they've already milled out the housings and gotten the product back from the platers when they silver plate them. So, we have usually five or six hands and sometimes the products that we build, but it's not uncommon to see like Amphenol and others do that too. So um, we're pretty comfortable with the test results. Um, the biggest problem that we've had to be fair to everybody is we really don't buy anything out of China. Um, we've had a lot of disastrous results. So we've really kind of pushed away from the table from those guys. So stick with stick with your domestic uh, European manufacturers on connectors is what I think I just heard you say. Yeah, or just non Chinese. I mean, we've even got a guys in South America building some products. They've built some end type products for us, and they've done a great job too out of Brazil. So, but and you just... you've got connectors on your website that you have full confidence in. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, everything's been put in there and it's been tested and we've been checking not only, you know, just generic tests like DC and HIPOT testing, but also RF testing and everything else that's applied to it before we release it to our customers. Okay. Uh, speaking of testing, what normal tests when I buy a cable assembly from you, does that cable see as far as sweeps, HIPOTs, et cetera? So the coax is swept in batches. Um, different stages. We steal some assemblies off the line that are fully made to be tested. Um, and that also allows us to do some different connector testing at that point in time. Um, everything generically gets tested up to six gig when we do it that process. Every individual assembly though, because we're already comfortable with the RF performance, we'll put it through and we'll do the high pot and continuity testing because we want to make sure that the breakdown of the dielectric inside the connector doesn't have a problem. So that 10 kV test real quick, we'll just check it to make sure that it doesn't uh, have any issues. If there is an issue or remotely comes to a short, the assembly just gets scrapped and we start all over. Um, then as far as the connectors go mechanically, um, when the batches come through, we usually pull some connectors at different stages and do various testing. Um, we don't have a classified pull tester, so we can't sign off formally on it just because we don't have an, a certification on our pull test, but we do have a machine 
and it'll do about a 400 pound test and we'll stress a connector out to see what it can do um, just to make sure that it, like the threads are right and then also make sure um, that if it comes apart, it's coming apart, you know, not prematurely. So there's a few things that we do on that too. Thank you. Great questions. Um, I'm curious on one thing, Chuck, if you can share it, if you can't, if it's private, don't then. Um, what percentage or uh, is, is ham, if you know, and if you can share, is like ham radio, amateur radio, of say your business and what people buy versus a any other commercial or government or whatever. I can, can, agree that you can share it. Oh, we can share that. I mean, I mean, amateur accounts for 30% of our sales. Um, and um, I just can't share the actual numbers, but I mean, it's about 30% of our sales is amateur. Um, and then commercially makes up in the neighborhood of about 50%. And then the leftovers from there generally split between government and municipality. Um, we're not always good at kind of recognizing sometimes how we've broken up that last 20%, but, um, but we do sell quite a bit to like, you know, commercially we talk about, we've got, you know, our standard commercial, which is sometimes the two way piece. Um, also, you know, we do some stuff with, some of the cell guys at the base stations. And then um, we also have the Wi-Fi and RFID. So um, even digital signage has come up. I mean, so we kind of blend commercial into a bigger bucket than we probably should. I mean, last month alone, we sold a number of cable assemblies to the guys who were doing the Ethereum wire wireless for the um for their cryptocurrency and sold a lot of cable to those guys to do those setups so it sometimes varies as far as what we do touch okay good thanks for that gives us an idea of how big the big the amateur market is in comparison to commercial and the other um our your friend john and southern jdm has a great question in talking with your customers what mistakes in selecting and using coax you see users making? Um, I guess the hardest thing to explain to people sometimes is um, bigger is not always better, is, is maybe sometimes the biggest challenge. Uh, we get sometimes clients that, you know, they want to go to the best, biggest cable they can go to, and it's not always the most practical in the sense of either weight or the insertion loss versus the performance on the frequency they're at. Um, there's a little bit of that that goes on too. Um, I guess one of the best examples I can give is, um, unfortunately, New Ham sometimes see the 400 material and say that's the best low loss that I can afford. And it lifts up the back of the radio because of its stiffness and the size of the radio or device or tuner, um, just because it's, it's a great cable, it's a, but it's a heavy, strong cable. So um, the, I guess overkill can be the biggest challenge sometimes. You're really good. Who else has a question? Just open your mic and give your call sign. Okay, maybe we'll get another one. I have a question about um, direct burial and, and jackets. Want to give us a little bit of what contaminating or non-contaminating is and how this direct burial stuff is uh, used or made or something around that. Uh, so uh, essentially we put, it's a set of pell pellets that come through um, and the pellets do different things. So there's a type of pellet that makes Every jacket, believe it or not, starts off, it's actually clear or partially opaque. And so by doing different things to that, we can, one, the UV inhibitor that's in there comes as a black pellet. So by mixing the right percentage of those black pellets in there, um, that then helps to resist against UV. And what that means is that it's designed to be baked for a period of no less than 20 years under standard UV conditions. Now, what does that mean? 
there's a government number that's applied to it as far as how much it can handle as far as the radiation goes for a certain period. So what you can do is you can age coax and some government agencies ask us to do that where you'll take the coax itself and put it under a UV light for a certain period of time based on their requirements. Um, unfortunately, I just don't have it in front of me, but it ages it for about two to three years and then we check to see if there's any crack or dryness. So that's kind of how you get your UV testing. Your non-contaminating is what it is, is that the coax goes through another system of pellets that are applied to it and um, they're made by Dow, surprisingly enough. They're one of the biggest suppliers in it, or not surprising, I should say. And what that does is it goes into a system where it's in a salt bath and it sits in that salt bath for usually about 30 days at a certain concentration. And then we take it out and we check it then after the next 30 days, as far as how much of the material starts to either degrade where it comes off or how much of the material will start to flake or change colors. Um, the best way to tell when the, the, the inhibitors start to go is because like I said, it's an opaque or a clear color is coax will have a tendency of getting lighter in color where it'll get a white flaky residue on there. And that's usually towards the end of the life cycle of the coax itself. Okay, uh, just one follow up from that. Um, I have some RG8X, I don't know who made it on a couple of reels. And instead of most coax I see, the, the jacket is black or very dark. Uh, this actually is gray. Um, uh, what's the difference to the um, UV, do you think, between a gray color or a lighter color and a black color? Because I know a lot of the, um, I can't think of the, the, the cable TV type stuff is more of a lighter color or a white or something. Well, we actually do, I mean, black, gray, and white are, are probably the three standard primary colors that have been applied to coax over the years. Um, you can do other colors. You can do red, you can do yellow, you, you can color it from a painting standpoint, but the, the core product itself has those three different variations. Um, the gray was realistically used as a marketing tool um originally just because the guys wanted to use it for the cb applications and to promote to them so back in the 70s um they kind of tried to differentiate the flavors of the product by having either a black jacket a gray or excuse me or a gray um and the gray wasn't a it's not a good or a bad product indifferent as far as the jacketing goes for the most part. It was just how it was applied between the black and the white pellets that were in there. Um, we actually make white non-contaminating product today that is available. Um, we do it for the medical industry for the carts for mobile MRIs, um, which is probably more than you guys want to know. but. Um, the interesting thing about that is if we don't get the compound just right, it can go to a deep gray in a hurry. Um, but it's something that we play with mixtures just to apply to what the customer wants. But it was kind of more of a marketing tool than anything else. That's interesting. That, that kind of makes sense. And then one variation, and then if somebody has another question. Um, I never really thought about it when you said uh, the medical field. There's probably a lot of RF. Uh, different RF or interference things inside a hospital. So can you just share a little bit of some of the different applications obvious uh, other, that, that cabling is used for other than the traditional, you know, RF, you're pumping a, you know, a, a hundred watts or something through it. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, some of the medical and other things that might be interesting to know about. Well, the, the, the one, the medical one was, um, so you got a big MRI machine, right? And it's not exactly something it's easily portable. Well, this one company um, designed it where it can be broken down into two pieces. One is the piece that the person sits in or the patient, and that's in one trailer. And then in the other trailer is all the control systems. And so because running the cables between the two systems can be cumbersome and take a lot of time, these were designed to be 
um, used in areas where they can't afford an MRI machine or don't have one readily available. So they put it into these trailers where they can then travel to these different towns. Doctors can do their medical testing, so on and so forth. Um, some other areas people don't naturally think to see about this, like I said, is um, one of them was the Ethereum piece where you've got a lot of guys that are doing the cryptocurrencies and they're now doing it over the different wireless applications there uh, because now with 5G and the new speed of the different networks, um, they've, got, they've tapped into that level of access. I know it goes a little bit alongside cellular. Um, we also have seen it for our um, company that does different signs, um, all the different road signs, obviously. People, you know, always thought, oh, they're programmed or they're programmed in advance or they put the little road sign out there stating that the lane is closed. Those, you know, pretty much all gone to being RF controlled versus having an operator have to find the right cable to plug into it to connect to make the adjustment on the sign of what it says. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of thought in those different terms, uh, payment systems now, you know, everybody looks at it a little cross-eyed as far as, you know, using your chip in your card and plugging it in versus just tapping it or having the wand go by. But those systems have been very popular from Amazon and we did a prototype there. Um, RFID for the packaging, people take for granted how much of it is actually in there. Uh, we have a company with an NDA, but I'll tell you, they drive brown trucks and they want to get everything with RFID labels in the next 10 years. I don't know how they're going to achieve it, but they want to try to make every package have an RFID label on there. So, um, I mean, you guys probably have seen it in different areas or facets of your lives too, or work. Um, but it seems that people don't grasp, you know, when they think wireless, well, there's always an antenna, a cable and a trans transceiver or something connected to it. Right. And we actually have increased our wire and cable usage over the last 25 years that number has grown 28 times in comparison. So since just before the 2000s, think about almost a 30X increase in the amount of wire we use, wire and cable for coax. That also indicates just a whole lot more um, wireless everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, up there. Be good. Okay, so this is what I'm going to think I'm going to do here is um, we're going to take one or two questions. We'll wrap up. I'll stop the recording. And anybody that wants to stick around, talk about anything else, um, uh, beside, and we'll let Chuck go if he needs to go. So thank you so much, Chuck. Any closing questions or comments? Anybody? Uh, uh, Wes says good stuff. A lot of information to chew on. So anybody have any uh, closing questions or thoughts for Chuck? Come now. Well, this has been really good, Chuck. You know, um, when I was looking for, uh, when we were looking for somebody to talk and I happened to mention to John, N6JDM, and he says, well, I know uh, one of his vendors uh, or suppliers does this. It was great. So really educational, learned a lot, surprised how much has changed over the years. Um, and not just in cabling, but in manufacturing. And of course, now we have you know, all the supply chain stuff. So, anything you'd like to say in closing before we? Uh, well, I appreciate. No, I do really appreciate everybody's time. I mean, it's always fun to do these things. It's always good to network a little bit. It's always good to, you know, you know. I hate to say that it, it's probably one of the most boring topics that you guys can face. <laughs> Cable's the last thing people think about, and once it's done, it's done. So. Uh, but I always think about it on a daily basis, obviously, and uh, it's always good to get out there and connect with everybody and get the questions and feedback because it's always food for thought from my end and stuff as well. So I do appreciate it. I appreciate everybody that's been customers to us or even if you're not and you got something out of this, you know, I, I always look for that as always a positive as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you. A couple of closing comments on chat. Great talk. Thanks again. 
for the info, Chuck, and very practical. And uh, Tony says, great uh, topic, very important for radio installations. Thank you. Okay, so anybody that wants to stick around, please do. I'm going to end this portion of the recording for the, for the Q&A presentation section of the SNARS monthly meeting. Thank you.